fire and wind. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled uh, The Covenant Connection. And, and I know we're going to receive an offering, but we'll do that a little later because I want you to get this message first, The Covenant Connection. So stand with me if you would, and if, you're, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Leviticus 27, or they may have the verses up on the screen for you. The Covenant Connection, Leviticus 27, beginning at verse 30. It says, In all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's, it is holy. Someone say, It is holy. It says, it is holy unto the Lord, and if a man will at all redeem of his tithe, he shall add thereto the fifth part. Somebody say the fifth part. That means 20%, a, a fifth is 20%. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, even of whatsoever path is under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the, the changer of shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, open our spiritual eyes and ears. Let us receive from heaven. Let your word be spoken. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. You can be seated. I want to talk to you this morning about the covenant connection. It's some interesting verses we were just reading about here. He said, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He's going to give us two things. One, he's going to give us eternal life. Amen. He's going to give us abundant life here on earth. We obtain life by accepting Jesus as Lord. We obtain abundant life by connecting to our covenant with him. And so that's what I want to talk to you about is connecting to this covenant we call the Word of God or the Bible. A lot of people have a Bible, but they don't have the promises written in the Bible. A lot of people may have the Word, but they don't necessarily have the abundance or the healing or the victory that's promised within the Word. And so today I want to help you to receive the blessings from the Bible and have them in, you know, activated into your life. You can have a refrigerator at home that doesn't do anything. Until you plug it in, amen? Uh, so, you know, some of us, I remember when we used to get VCRs, you'd get them, but you didn't know how to program them, you know? There was a lot of blessings that it had that we didn't know how to do. We have that with our, our smartphones today. Some people can do all kinds of things with their smartphone. Let me see here, I'm going to call somebody in China. No, I'm just kidding. But a lot of us can do all, all kinds of things with our smartphone, and others, all they can do is call, <laughs> you know. And uh, you ask them what time it is, they say, I don't know. You say, well, check your phone. They say, ah, my phone doesn't tell time. You say, yeah, it does. They say, it does? I didn't know that, you know. Check the web. They're like, where? On your phone. <laughs> They'll say, well, I didn't know it could do that. Yeah, it can. Amen. There's so many things that it can do, but a lot, some people don't know about it. And there's so many blessings that we have as believers, but yet a lot of people don't know about them. Amen. It's like... Uh, you know, you have to connect to the, the covenant. You have to plug the appliance in. If you go to an apartment complex and you say, I'd like one of your lease agreements, and they give you one, that doesn't mean you can go out and start swimming in the pool and using their, you know, tennis courts or their, uh, you know, community uh, house or building. You have to execute the agreement, amen? Can't just have it. That's not good enough. You go try to get into the, the swimming pool and, and the gate's locked and you can't get in. And if you go ask them, well, how come this doesn't work? I, I've got one of your agreements. They're going to say, you haven't executed it yet. you got to make it work. Amen? And then they'll tell you what you need to do. They'll say, when you, you know, you give us 
what belongs to us. You give us a deposit and you give us a monthly rent and then we're going to give you what belongs to you. We're going to give you an apartment and we're going to give you the keys that access these other things. But if you don't connect to the covenant, you don't get the keys. Hello. I've had people say, well, how come God's not blessing me? And I said, well, if you want to make a withdrawal from the bank, the first thing you got to do is make a deposit. Hello. If you try to make a, a withdrawal from the bank without making a deposit, uh, th they call that bank robbery. You, you, you don't want to do that, okay? So I want to show you how you can access the covenant that we call the Bible. How many of you would like the promises in the Bible in your life, amen? The Bible promises that we're to be the head and not the tail, blessed and not cursed, above and not beneath, riding and not walking. It says the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. It says that you can be blessed and your children can be blessed physically, spiritually, socially. These are just some of the promises that are in the word of God. And they're wonderful. And I don't want to just see them in the word of God, but I want to see them in my life. Amen? But, there, but the Bible speaks about connecting to this covenant. In Deuteronomy 8.18, this is what the word of God says. It says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that you may establish, or that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day or today. He says, remember the Lord. It's, he's the one that gives you the ability to gain wealth. See, God gives us hands to work with and um, a brain to think with and a mouth to speak with. He, and he gives you the ability to gain wealth. He gives, gives you the ability to earn a living that, that you may be able to establish this covenant. The word establish has within it the word stability to, or to make it stand, to make it stable. God says, I'm going to give you wealth so you can connect to the covenant. Notice your wealth has something to do with connecting to the covenant. He gives us the ability to gain wealth. It doesn't say he gives us wealth. It says he gives us the ability to gain wealth. And, and, and yes, he does give us blessings. But first we have to connect to the covenant. And we connect by giving something that belongs to us. See, God gave something that belonged to him, didn't he? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And God wants us to give something that belongs to us. So he gives us the ability to get something. So that now we have something that's ours. So we can give something and connect to his covenant. God wants us to give what we have so that he can give us what we don't have. God wants to give us eternal life. We don't have eternal life, but God makes a provision where we can accept Jesus and receive eternal life. God wants us to have supernatural abundance. We don't have that supernatural abundance, but God makes a provision, amen, so that we can get it, we can access it. And I'm not just talking about the ability to pay your bills or the ability to be debt free, but I'm, I'm talking about the ability to make enough to put money in your bank and let the bank pay interest to you, amen. So many of us are, are you know, we're trying to pay this bill and that bill and, uh, you know, our credit card payment and our electric payment and our gas payment and our uh, fuel for the car payment and our car payment and our insurance payment and man uh, we have too much week at the end of our money God wants to make it to where you have too much money at the end of the week amen I remember uh, a while back there was a comedian he was talking about wealth and being rich he says there's a difference between being rich and being wealthy being blessed and being abundantly blessed he said, Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq, he said, Shaq is rich. He said, but the guy who pays him his check is wealthy. Amen. The old Frito Bandito used to say, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. <laughs> and it's good to receive. Amen. It's nice to be able to, somebody comes and says, hey, here's $100 for help you buy lunch today. Wow, that's a blessing. But I won't tell you what, it's even better to be able to be the one giving out the $100. Trust me, it's better to give than to receive. Amen? See, in Genesis 12, God made a promise to Abraham. In Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give stuff to you. I'm going to bless you. But I'm going to make you so great that you're going to be a blessing. See, God blesses us to be a blessing. 
He gives us abundance so that we can become a seed sower, a giver. Amen. He says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make your name great and you shall be a blessing. You're going to be able to bless others. He doesn't want you just to be blessed, but he wants you to be blessed and be a blessing. It's kind of interesting to me that the first thing he said was, leave your relatives. Hello. Leave those people that are around you that, that don't believe in you. The ones that don't have confidence in you, he said, he said leave them alone. And I noticed that when, when Abram left them, one of them followed after him. Hello. Lot said, can I go with you? I want to tell you something, when God starts blessing you, uh, friends and, and family and neighbors will come out of the woodwork. Amen. And they'll all want to tell you what to do with those blessings. Amen. I've had a lot of people tell me, man, I have so many people that want to tell me how to spend my money. Amen. That happens. Amen. And he didn't say, Abram, I'm blessing you. But rather, he said, I'm going to bless you. God made a covenant with Abraham, and as with any covenant or with any agreement, there are stipulations that have to be fulfilled by both parties. It hadn't been established yet. In other words, it hadn't, been, it hadn't stood yet. God told Abraham that he's, he, I'm going to bless you in Genesis 12. And if you follow Abraham, you can see that God's hand was upon him. But he doesn't get his official blessing until Genesis chapter 14 and beginning at verse 18. It says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was a priest of the most high God. Now, now we see Abraham in, in Genesis 14 with God's high priest. And notice, first of all, that the high priest is bringing bread and wine. These are symbols of holy communion. What does the bread symbolize? Jesus said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. The crushed grapes that made the wine, he said, this wine represents my blood, which is shed for you. So the high priest is bringing the symbols of God's part of the covenant. He was saying, Abram, I'm going to give my only begotten son. And you're going to give your son. That's the covenant. See, in any covenant, any contract, you want to give something of similar value. If, I, if you say, I have a motorcycle for sale, and I say, well, how much is it? And you say, a half a million dollars. It better be Elvis Presley's old motorcycle. <laughs> and not the Honda you bought two weeks ago for, for 200 bucks. Hello. That wouldn't be right. And, and they don't have to be the exact same value, but they need to be similar. Amen. See, I, I'm not telling you that Isaac was equal to Jesus. No way. Not at all. But the price that God paid, given his only son, and Abraham giving his son Isaac, his son of promise, those are similar gifts. See, when, when it comes to connecting to the covenant, it's not about the amount you give. It's about the sacrifice. It's not about an equal gift. It's about an equal sacrifice. The vice president of a major oil company here in Houston, when he gives his offering, it may be more than the, the, the lady who's working in the lunchroom at the local elementary school. But it's not about the amount. It's about the sacrifice. When God says bring the tithe, he's saying you give a tenth of your increase. And, and for the one, a tenth is a lot. For the other, a tenth is maybe not as much. But to each of them, it means the same. Do you understand that? It's not about an equal amount. It's about an equal sacrifice. And this Melchizedek, it, it says, uh, it, it describes him in a way that this may not have just been anybody. Some people believe this was the pre-incarnate Christ. In Hebrews 7, beginning at verse 1, it says this. Melchizedek, king of Salem, which means king of peace. It says, a priest of the most high God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being by interpretation king of righteousness. And after that also the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But made as unto the son of God, abides priest continually. Now what it says about this person, Melchizedek, is that he didn't have a beginning, didn't have an end, he didn't have a mother, didn't have a father, he's been here all the time, and he's the, the priest of God forever. There's only one that fits that description, and that's Jesus, amen? At the very least, he was a picture of Jesus. Who do we know is the king of righteousness and king of peace? That's Jesus, amen? So, so this guy was either the pre-incarnate Christ or, or at the very least a picture of Jesus. And he's going to establish this covenant with Abraham. And he takes the first step of the, pro uh, of the process. He brings the bread and wine. That means 
Jesus is going to give his life. My body will be broken. My blood will be shed. God is saying, I'm giving you my son. And what does Abraham bring? He gives him a tithe or a tenth of all that he has. Sometimes people will tell me, Pastor, is the tithe important? Yes, it's, it's just as important as Jesus. That, that was the covenant. I'm going to give you my only begotten son. And Abraham said, I'm going to give my son. But God said, no, I'm going to give him back to you. You don't have to sacrifice your son. But bring a tithe then, a tenth of your increase. This past week, I was talking to someone whose son is very ill and in the hospital. And I had read an article about something that might be able to help him. And, and I said, hey, listen, I want to show you this. I, I don't know a lot about it, but, I, but I, I've read about this and heard about it. And it might be able to help your son. I said, now, I heard it's a little more expensive. And this was the response. I don't care what it costs. I would give anything to save my son. Amen? I mean, wouldn't we all do that? For our children? Oh, my gosh. I heard on the news a while back about a little 18-month-old boy getting shot. It broke my heart. And this is a little boy in, in some other state. I've never met him. I don't know him. But just the thought of that, it was horrible. And then I think about God saying, I'm going to give my little boy. My only begotten son. He's going to die for you. But Abraham, you don't have to give your son. I know that would be the right thing to do. I'm going to give your son back. Just bring a tenth part of your increase. And that will connect to the covenant. Wow. What a loving God that would be. And then for us to say, no, nah, I don't think I want to do that. That's making a mockery of the price that Jesus paid. No, nah, I don't want to do it. No, nah, I need it. I'm going to get cable TV. Whew. The tithe is holy. Say that again. Say the tithe is holy. When it says the tithe is holy, it means that belongs to God. And if we take what belongs to God and we, and we make it common, we, we put it amongst our own stuff, that makes God very unhappy. I mean, if, if you gave your child's life and, and all somebody else had to do was give a tenth of their paycheck, and they said, nah, I'm not going to do it. I, I want cable TV. I want to get new rims for my car. Would you be a little upset? I, I think you probably would, and rightfully so. In Genesis 14, 19, when they, when they make the, the covenant, it says here, and he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of the heaven and the earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him a tithe of all he had. Abraham brought a tenth part. A, the ten is a covenant number. That's why we have the ten commandments. That's why in the last days it says there's going to be a ten nation confederation. That's why we have 10 numbers in our numbering system. It's a covenant number that God gave us. Abraham brought the 10th. He connected to the covenant. A lot of people don't realize the, the value of the tithe. And again, it's not about the amount. It's about the sacrifice. Isaac wasn't the same as Jesus. Isaac wasn't perfect. Isaac wasn't sinless. Isaac couldn't walk on water. Or heal the sick or raise the dead or cast out devils. No, but... But Isaac was Abraham's son, and Jesus was the son of God. And so even though, it wasn't, even though it wasn't the same price, it was the same sacrifice. It's not about the same amount. It's about an equal sacrifice. When you pay your tithe, you set the covenant in motion. In Luke 6, 38, it says this, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure you meet, with all it will be measured to you again. God said it this way, I believe it was in Malachi. He said, return unto me and I will return unto you. And they said, what are you talking about? He said, he said tithes and offering. He said, bring the tithes into the storehouse that they'll be meat in my house. And prove me now here with, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there'll not be room enough to receive it. He says, return unto me and, and I'll return unto you. And, and if you've ever returned something to a department store. The other day I, I returned something to... Uh, Lowe's. And I said, you know, I got this here and it's the wrong one. I, I want to exchange it for another. And she said, sir? I said, yes. She said, do you have your receipt? I said, yes, it's right here. She goes, that's what I thought. She said, you bought this at Home Depot. <laughs> I went, oh, man, I forgot. She said, yeah, we can't give you your money back because this isn't ours. You got to take it there. 
See, when you return something, you, you have to give them back something that was theirs. And they're going to give you back something that was yours. God says, return unto me. You give me what belongs to me. And I'm going to give you what I have for you. Amen. Leviticus 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them in his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them. And there went out a fire from the Lord, and it devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Okay, let me explain what happened here. Uh, these two sons of the high priest, God had a miraculous fire in the temple that they were supposed to keep uh, fueled. But they didn't let it continue to, to burn. God started that fire. It was not a regular fire. But they just said, ah, let's just get some matches. We'll light a fire. You know, it, it doesn't need to be a miracle. And they took something that was holy, and they put it to common use, and they died that day. God doesn't like it when you take something that's holy and put it to common use. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9, it says, And when they came into the threshing floor of Shidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark, because the oxen stumbled, and he went and touched the ark. To, and it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand on the ark, and there he died. The ark of the covenant was holy. The fire was holy. Uzzah dared touch something holy, and God said, Nope. And he died. God's serious about it. You don't just touch the things of God if you're not supposed to. In Daniel chapter 5, verse 2, this is, uh, I remember reading this verse and I thought, boy, this is really interesting. Talk about getting sobered up real quick. King Belshazzar, who was over the empire at the time, was getting drunk and getting wasted with his women friends and his buddies. And he said, bring the things of God in here. Bring the holy vessels. We're going to drink wine out of them. Just make a mockery of God. It says here, Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and the silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple, which is in Jerusalem. These things belonged to God. They were holy. That the king and his prince's wives and his concubines might drink therein. And in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote against the wall, a candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that his joints of his loins were loosened, and his knees smote one against the other. I like the way the King James put that. There's other ways we could write it. God scared the... But the King James <laughs> says it this way. His thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against the other. The king was frightened to death. And this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tikal ufarsin. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikal, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Wow, Uzzah touched the ark. He died. Belshazzar touched the holy vessels. He died. The sons of the high priest did a, made a mockery of the, the holy fire. They died. How dare we make anything less of the tithe than what they are? The tithe is our covenant connector. Leviticus 27, verse 30 through 34. And, and all the tithes of the land, whether it's the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. We just read that God is pretty serious about holy things, isn't he? When something's holy, we shouldn't just take it and try to put it to common use. You might remember God had told Joshua, every place you set your foot, you're gonna, it's going to be yours. But yet the second battle he fought, a place called Ai, he lost. And he didn't understand why he lost, so he went to God and God said, examine your people. Somebody has taken a holy thing, something that belonged to me, and put it to common use. And in Joshua 7, verse 10 through 11, it says this, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they've transgressed my covenant, which I command them, for they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and assembled also, and they have even put it amongst their own stuff. And after examination in Joshua 7, verse 21, 
they found Achan and, and he asked him, he said, Achan, why have you done this? He said, well, when I saw among the, the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, 50 shekels in weight, I coveted them and I took them and behold, they're, in, they're hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And so Joshua sent messengers and they ran and to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel. And they laid them before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garments and the wedge of gold. It would be great if it just stopped there, but it doesn't. It says they took his sons and his daughters and his wife and his dog and his sheep. And I can imagine the dog going, hey, roll, roll, it wasn't me, <laughs> you know. But Achan was in charge. And Achan sinned against God. And he touched something that was holy. And God said, nope, you've gone too far. And Joshua said, we're going to clean this out of the, the camp. And they, and they put him in the midst of the people. And the people stoned them. And then they burned him with fire and just buried him right there. Wow, it was no small infraction. Even his sheep suffered for his crime. Somebody say this, say the tithe is holy. Say it again, say the tithe is holy. The tithe is like the tree in the midst of the garden. God said you can have everything else, just don't touch this tree. Isn't it amazing? God gives us the ability to gain wealth and he says you can keep 90% of it. You know, all this is yours. Just this one part belongs to me. Don't touch it. Eve said, God said, don't eat that tree, don't even touch it. And some pe people say, well, God never told him not to touch it. He did. You say, well, pastor, I, it's not in the Bible. How, why would you say God told him not to touch it? Because Eve was there and Eve said, God told us not to eat of the tree. Don't even touch it or you'll die. And if Eve was lying, that would have been the first sin. But it wasn't. She wasn't sinning. She was telling the truth. God told him, don't eat of that tree, don't touch it. That's what I tell my kids. Don't get near it. Don't look at it. <laughs> Hello. Don't go in that room. <laughs> Stay far away. But temptation. And as a result, God had to take him out of the garden and eat him. Not, not as a punishment, but he didn't want them to eat of the tree of eternal life and live for eternity in a handicapped state. God in his love said, get them out of there. Let's restore them. And then let him eat of that tree and, 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 and live forever. And the price of restoration was his only begotten son. Jesus had to die that we might live. The son of God became a man so that men could become the sons of God. Wow. The tithe is holy. Somebody say the tithe is holy. Look at the book of Malachi chapter 3 and see if we maybe can understand these verses a little better now. He says, even from the days, Malachi 3 beginning at verse 7, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. Give me what belongs to me. I, I took the thing to the right store and they gave me my money back. <laughs> when I returned what belonged to them, they returned what belonged to me. God says, return unto me and I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. But you're saying, where, where shall we return? He says, will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me, even this whole nation. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat enough in my house. And prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You know, God wants to bless you. And God wants you to be a blessing. He wants you to have enough and to spare he doesn't want you to barely get by. If you're barely getting by, who can you help? God says, help the widows and the orphans. Help those that are less fortunate. Those that can't buy groceries this Thanksgiving, you help them out. But how are you going to help them out if you're barely getting by and you can't pay your light bill? God says, I want you to have enough and to spare. I want you to be blessed to be a blessing. And he doesn't just tell us that's what he wants, but he tells us how to get it. He says, give. And I'm going to have the ushers come at this time as we prepare to, to give. God said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm going to ask the, the, the clerks if they would come back, David and uh, Felicia. 
God said, give and it shall be given unto you. Never can we be more like God than when we give. For God so loved the world that he gave. Amen. The tithe is our covenant connector. The tithe is holy. And I'm going to ask the ushers this morning to pass out the offering envelopes as we prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offering. And you might be here today and you might say, well, pastor, I've never given my tithe. It's hard. I, you know, when I knew I was saved, when I started paying my tithes. I mean, I grew up, we were poor. The, the first pair of new blue jeans that I bought was when I was 18 years old. I bought them myself at JCPenney with a JCPenney credit card. That was over 40 years ago. Last week, I just paid them off. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> I remember, I mean, you know, we didn't have much. I, I wore what my brothers wore, you know, when they, they got too small for them. The bad thing is I, I had eight brothers, <laughs> you know. So sometimes you'd get a pair of pants, you're like, man, you should take better care of these, man, you know. <laughs> God wants to bless you. Sometimes people say, well, does God need my money? I say, come on, he's God. Does he need anything? Does God lack anything? Are you kidding me? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I said, God doesn't lack anything. He doesn't need in that manner of the word anything. I said, but he asked us for something. He asked us to give, not because he wants to get something from us, but he wants to get something to us. He says, return unto me. I I've got something that belongs to you. But I can't give it to you until you give me what belongs to me. And if you'll do that, whoo, I'm going to give you what I promised you. And I want to tell you something. It's a blessing. It'll be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It'll be more than enough. I'm going to make you blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Let's pray together right now and ask the Lord to direct us in our giving. And I want to encourage you connect to the covenant we call the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence right now. And Lord, I pray you'll open the windows of heaven and pour your spirit out upon us. Lord, help us all to be faithful to you and to your word. Help us to connect to this covenant we call the word of God. Help us to be faithful in our giving. And Lord, bless the giver. Multiply the gift back to them many times over. And as always, we pray that every soul, every dollar given would represent a soul, one into the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Broadcast now, I, want you I hope to the message ministered to you. Listen, I want to encourage you to invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. If you haven't done that already, do that now. All you got to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash them away with your blood. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. And I make a vow to serve you, Jesus, as Lord of my life for the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer with me, if you believe it in your heart, you confess with your mouth, you're saved. Amen. And I want to ask you if you would consider sowing a financial seed into the ministry. The, it's simple to do. All you got to do is text any amount to the number on your screen, 940-241-4450. That number again is 940-241-4450. You can text any amount to that number. Or if you'd like, you can go on our website, uh, clc-church.com. That's clc-church.com. And on the menu bar, the word, you'll see the word give. Click on the button that says give. A menu will drop down, and you can give through PayPal that way. Or if you'd like to mail an offering in, you can do that. Our mailing address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. And the zip is 77339. That's 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. Zip is 77339. Of course, my favorite way for you to give is to come into the church and fellowship with us. We just want to get to meet you and love you and uh, pray with you. And we hope to see you here soon. Come out and visit us, Christian Life Center here in Kingwood, Texas. Once again, thanks for watching. God bless you.